Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I, um, I'm Gary Greenswag and happy to be your uh, moderator for this morning, along with Dr. Sagar um, and Dr. Michael Dudas, who will join us for our panel. Uh, we uh, Today is St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Dr. McGinn is not here today, but in honor of St. Patrick's Day, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I have my blue tie on with green frogs. Uh, so just in honor of St. Patrick's Day, I had a little time, hard time finding a green tie, but there you have it. Uh, so I would like to start with introducing our speakers. First, uh, Shelly Schlenker, who I have had the privilege of knowing for a good 10 and a half years since I joined Dignity Health uh, in the day. Um, uh, Shelly Schlenker serves as the Executive Vice President, Chief Advocacy Officer for Common Spirit Health, Executive uh, oh, right, Chief uh, for Common Spirit Health. Uh, she has uh, been a senior advisory leader at Dignity Health uh, and uh, has had nearly 20 years uh, before the formation of this new ministry with uh, Dignity Health. She's responsible for creating and implementing a comprehensive multifaceted advocacy program with the largest Catholic health system in the United States, that's us, um, encompassing legislative and um, regulatory policy matters at the state and federal levels, sustainability, violence prevention, and social responsibility investing, which we're going to talk about this morning. Presently, she serves on the board of the Catholic Health Association of the United States and Trauma Centers of America. Uh, next, uh, Laura Kraus, who will be uh, presenting a bulk of the information this morning, serves as the System Director for Advocacy Programs and has worked in violence prevention for uh, Common Spirit Health for over 14 years, directing the organization's United Against Violence initiative. United Against Violence is a multifaceted initiative that addresses the complex issue of violence using comprehensive strategy, including public policy advocacy, shareholder advocacy, education and awareness, uh, and community-based uh, violence prevention. In her time with Common Spirit, she has assisted communities in addressing child abuse, bullying, youth violence, interpersonal violence, dating violence, family violence, human trafficking, group-involved violence, and gun violence. Uh, she is a co-author of Common Spirit's community-based violence prevention model and guide, which is the framework supporting individual communities to develop their own unique violence solutions. And I'm gonna just take a moment to introduce Dr. Michael Dudas, who's joining us uh, for this talk and for the panel. Um, uh, Dr. Dudas is an outpatient pediatrician at the at Virginia Mason Franciscan Health in Seattle, Washington. As Chief of Pediatrics and Deputy Chief of Primary Care at Virginia Mason, he helps support an incredible team of pediatric providers and uh, to improve care delivered to our primary care patients. Uh, Dr. Dudas is also Chair of the Physician Enterprise Ambulatory Pediatric Collaborative. He supports the work of the collaborative uh, members to improve lifelong health and well-being of patients that we serve throughout the country. So with that, uh, Dr. Sagar, uh, welcome. Good morning. Um, I didn't introduce Dr. Sagar, but I, I, we know Dr. Sagar. Okay. So, uh, but so she has a just a slide or two, and then we're going to um, turn it over to Laura. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Greenswag. Um, so you know, this is a very special and a unique grand rounds because we're here to talk about advocacy. Um, and we just wanted to set some ground rules because we want to make sure that each of us has the opportunity to be able to engage in this topic. Um, but we want to make sure we're engaging respectfully. Um, there's a lot to learn and to reflect on. So we want to make sure this is an open dialogue. It's not necessarily a debate with our speakers or with the world in general, um, but we want to be very respectful. And um, we want to really embrace the power of humble listening. And I think all of our audience members are so good at this, but we just wanted to set up a quick reminder for everybody about why we're here. Um, speaking of why we're here, I wanted to share, you know me, I can't get through a talk without sharing a new uh, article with you all. So this is a viewpoint, really very well done viewpoint in JAMA published this past week. Um, talking about all-cause mortality in U.S. children and adolescents. And um, the, what the striking data is that we are seeing an uptick of all-cause mortality for the first time in many years. And it is really being targeted more so due to automobile injuries, 
homicide, suicide, and poisoning. Poisoning in the realm of not necessarily household substances, but actually from um, substance use and overdose poisoning. What I want to leave you with is, um, in the author's words, what they said was, you know, that medicine and public health have made these remarkable progress in lowering pediatric mortality rates, but the lives they have saved are now endangered by man-made pathogens. Bullets, drugs, and automobiles are now causing a youth death toll sufficient to elevate all-cause mortality rates, the largest such increase in the recent memory. And they continue on to end their viewpoint by challenging us to think about this, that without bold action to reverse this trend, children's risk of not reaching adulthood may increase. And this is why we are here to talk about what each of us can do and what our common spirit health system is doing on behalf of advocacy to make sure this does not become a reality in the near future. And with that, I want to pass it off to Laura Krause to take us through. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring up the slides here. Is that where everybody see that? All right, perfect. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through these next slides, the learning objectives. You'll receive these so you can uh, read it more in depth at your leisure. Um, but we're going to talk about Common Spirit's public policy position on guns, public position on guns, because that's an important piece of what we do and how we do it. We'll also learn more about the United Against Violence program. I know we introduced that last time, but I want to help you understand what's being done in the space of gun violence or gun safety in these def various pillars. And then also learn about some gun safety programs that either are being implemented or people are considering implementing in our communities um, that uh, may be very helpful to us enlarging these conversations. So the agenda, you'll hear first from Shelly. She's gonna talk about the position and some of our gun data. I will talk about our United Against a Violence program and then the safety program. So Shelly, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. And I'm going to start with um, gun safety. Gun violence prevention is one of many very polarized issues in our nation. Common Spirit really focuses on making sure that we are approaching it from an advocate point of view and not an activist. Um, and our goal is um, to advance gun uh, violence, sensible solutions that promote gun safety and prevent violence, but not address, they can peacefully coexist with the Second Amendment. A lot of times there's discussion when we bring up how we approach our uh, pu public position that we're trying to take people's guns away. And I want to just say, that's not true. Um, we take a multifaceted approach and we do work across um, the various uh, modalities. So we work on public policy laws that have common sense things like background checks. Uh, we work in shareholder advocacy where we try and influence some of the public, uh, publicly traded gun makers to address safety. And today we're going to talk about the third, which is United Against Violence, which is how we can engage with our communities and with our physicians, our internal um, focused view in how we can contribute to better gun safety in our nation. Laura, if you'd go to the next slide. We are really called to this work because we can see internally those um, numbers. We have 3,100 gun injury encounters in a given year. And when you look at the numbers, I think what's striking to me is 62% of them are accidental cause. That's someone shot someone accidentally or, or the like. And when you link back to what Ankara was talking about with children, many of these accidental uh, shootings are with kids. So what can we do to change the platform to begin to create that um, space where it's safe for all of us to be talking about gun safety? Um, and all of this cost comes at a cost, but it's really not the fiscal cost 
it's the loss of lives and and uh we we have to always keep focused on the patients and the injuries and the loss of life and that's what calls us to this work laura i'll hand it off here to you to talk a little bit more about u.s statistics and um, i'll be happy to participate in the panel at the end Great. Thank you so much, Shelley. There were 40 over 45,000 gun deaths in 2020, which is uh, last year we have record of, and that's more than um, than any year on record. Um, there's been a, a four, so leading cause of death first time for children, 42% increase since 2000 in child fatalities due to guns. Uh, suicide deaths by firearm accounted for 47% of all youth suicides in 2021. And in general, for all ages, suicides account for 54% of all gun deaths and 53% of suicides are carried out using a firearm, which is almost always lethal. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit now about um, our United Against Violence program. Uh, we started to address this in 2008 when we really saw that violence is a public health issue. And it is our lane, as you've heard that terminology before, um, because it, we're seeing the gun violence in our facilities. And therefore, because it is a public health issue, we can address it and we should address it. So we came up with United Against Violence. We worked early on with the Prevention Institute, which um, taught us that violence is complex and therefore you can't just have a singular solution. Every solution must be multifaceted. And that really includes everything from through the community level to the greater society. And for us, we think of this approach at a system level and at a community level. And I'll talk more about that community level uh, when we go further. But these are the pillars. Uh, you've heard about them already. Um, so I won't uh, belabor them, but instead, in the interest of time, just dive right in. So public policy advocacy on gun safety, and I wish our colleague Katie was here. She is our public policy expert in the realm of violence prevention, and I work very closely with her, but uh, she sent me some notes, so I will go through this with you. So, you know, we, we consider violence prevention in general, but especially gun violence prevention in this space of legislation, very, very important. Um, sometimes there's been a stalemate, but the Biden administration has managed to advance some things. Um, so uh, we're, we focus here on community prevention and intervention funding and safe storage, background checks, and other common sense reforms. The biggest bill that has passed uh, was the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and it was signed by President Biden in June of 2022. And that increased funding for intervention programs and mental health, which we were really happy about. It also enhanced background checks for those under 21 and closed the boyfriend loophole, which for those of you that don't know is a federal law that disallowed domestic abusers from owning a gun, uh, but only if they're married or living with a person or have a child. <coughs> Thus the boyfriend loophole, um, the boyfriend could still have a gun. It also uh, provides state and local governments with funding to implement extreme risk protection orders, sometimes called red flag laws. And these laws are those that allow a person's gun to be taken away if they are deemed to potentially be a threat to themselves or others. Um, just this last Thursday, President Biden announced an executive order that did a number of things to curb gun violence. Um, and this was without the ability, without Congress needing to pass this legislation. It strengthens background checks by ensuring all firearms um, must be, they have to have a background check in order to be purchased. It improves public awareness of red flag laws and safe storage of firearms. It provides a list of dealers that break federal law um, to the public and lawmakers. So, so there would be a, a, a reporting of those that are breaking the law to increase accountability. And it encourages the FTC to report on how guns are being marketed to youth along with the overall public po public uh, in general um, through militarized imagery. Um, one of the best things that this does is that it requires um, agencies associated with these to report within 60 days a plan on full implementation of the law. So that's our public policy efforts in the gun space. And Shelley alluded also to our shareholder advocacy efforts. So I wanna just say right at the top, um, we don't own gun manufacturers in our greater portfolio. However, we do own very small amounts, the minimum amount in a special portfolio that allows me to engage with them because they need to come to the table uh, when we're talking about gun violence prevention since they make the product that contributes to it. 
So um, we have led with Sturm Ruger and co-filed with Smith & Wesson, and we lead in this space in general in the shareholder community on uh, gun safety and gun violence prevention with the manufacturers. We have filed resolutions on gun safety and human rights impacts, and then this year filed on marketing risks. The two resolutions you see there first on gun safety and human rights impacts both received almost 70% of shareholder support. And in 2018, as a result, we saw reports come out from the companies on gun safety. Um, they weren't exactly what we were looking for, but the company did comply. This past year, we filed on human rights impacts and got that majority vote, but we don't necessarily think the company is going to actually conduct one. The SEC rules do not make these shareholder resolutions binding, but when 70% of your shareholders say they want something, the company should listen. In case they don't, we have filed this year on marketing risks, as we have seen many of these mass shootings in particular uh, come from um, men who um, are really sort of being challenged with their masculinity, um, and the Manufacturers seem to be taking advantage of that with some really risky marketing um, that has unfortunately allowed things like the Sandy Hook families to actually uh, settle with uh, Remington uh, because Remington had such horrific practices that did impact that shooter. We also work with Dollar General and Dollar Tree on levels of gun violence in their stores. All you can you can do a simple Google search and see that it is horrific. Um, and we filed before with the credit card and shipping companies on ghost guns. And could they do something to stop uh, that form of gun? Because those guns are completely untraceable and very easily purchased online. I put these media entities at the bottom here because when we filed on the human rights impact assessment, the media really noticed. Um, and that's important because it speaks to a couple of things. It certainly supports the efforts that we're doing and lets us know we're on the right track, right? Um, but also increases awareness. So now to education and awareness, media coverage, that's a great form of awareness. But we do have a website there that you can look at uh, at your leisure. Uh, we have a video that was created by our brand team. We do presentations and webinars anytime anyone allows me to speak about this. I am right there. So AHA, CHA, NGOs, and health systems. And then within Common Spirit, we have um, a, a violence prevention community of preventionists. And I gather them on a monthly basis to share best practices, to ask questions, and to learn from one another, as well as on quarterly learning labs where we take deeper dives into forms of education so we can really be on the cutting edge of what works. So this is our community-based violence prevention program model. Now, last time I didn't share this with you. I wanted to this time because I think it's important. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about this. So those first five steps there, um, are what we we ask of an implementation grant. We grant fund this money in two ways. We have implementation grants and we have, um, I'm sorry, we have, <laughs> I'm sorry, planning grants, program planning grants and implementation grants. Most grant applications don't ask you to plan first and submit a, 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 a you know, an application for planning. We do because we don't want the hospital going into the community and saying, well, Thankfully, we're here and we know your problem and boy, we have the solutions for you and everything's going to be fixed. We know that doesn't work. Um, the community needs, they know their problems and they know their solutions. So in these planning grants, we have um, our hospitals go in, amass a group of stakeholders and together talk about it, look at the needs and the assets, and then together collectively in that coalition, identify what form of violence they're going to work on, establish a baseline, a baseline and then develop that action plan. And then after that, steps six through eight are implementation. And we will give uh, three years funding uh, up to three times for a community to put this work into play because violence prevention is a very long term thing. Um, since 2009, we've had over 50 of these programs and we have funded them at over 35 million. And our model is available at that link at the bottom. Why do these work? Well, I've already said community identified, community driven, multiple prevention approaches. Uh, we, we do primary, secondary and tertiary in all of our programs uh, because we need all three working together to really address violence. And we ask our, our once they get into the um, part of developing the program, we ask our communities to work along the spectrum of prevention. Also not ours, this is from the Prevention Institute. 
Um, but we've found, we've seen that when a community puts activities in each of these buckets of the spectrum, we can really move the needle as far as um, making a difference and reducing violence. So here is here are four of our programs. I can't talk about all of them, obviously, but I want to talk a little bit about these four, one of which has intentionally addressed gun violence from the very beginning and youth gun violence, and three that have moved into this space, and I'll talk a little bit more about why. Chester County Coalition um, in Pennsylvania is actually a community uh, that comes from our congregations of women religious, and they have a horrific rate of gun violence and have seen youth gun violence just spiral. So they have been intentionally addressing that uh, through a variety of methods. Um, our Dayton program and our Washington program both have addressed youth violence, but have necessarily moved into gun violence, especially with the pandemic. We saw um, youth violence increase, but especially gun violence and unfortunately youth homicide. So they've had to move in more and more into these spaces. And then CHI St. Joseph in Kentucky they actually work on child abuse, neglect, and fatalities. However, in this last grant round, they asked if they could move into safety, and we said yes, absolutely. So um, they wanted to address water safety, fire safety, and gun safety. And the gun safety was a little bit challenge when, challenging when you're trying to work in a very rural community that is very has high gun ownership. Um, it was a little bit more difficult to get into. So we're going to talk about some safety programs and how they did it. Um, the pictures at the bottom there, I just want to say on the left there is our Dayton community. That's their young adult focus council visiting a community garden and learning about that. A great form of prevention. And um, it's just a, a great way. We found these garden programs are amazing. Um, but then on the right there, this is the Eddie Eagle program. And this is the program that ultimately they got implemented in London, Kentucky. And so I'm going to cover very, very quickly three programs uh, that that address gun safety. I will say upfront, all three are neutral. And you may be surprised by that when you hear who is behind these programs. But I wanna say all three are neutral. They do not promote gun ownership, nor do they um, you know, condemn gun ownership. This is 100% about safety. End Family Fire is a program of the Brady Project. Uh, which you may know better by the Brady campaign. They've rebranded along the years. Um, this is an organization um, that has been typically seen as being sort of more on the left of this issue. This program and Family Fire was intentionally designed to include gun owners in these conversations. So it was designed with gun owners. Um, the message is store your guns locked, unloaded and separate from ammunition talk to family and friends about guns that may be unlocked or loaded, and in, just encourages conversations on responsible gun ownership and safety. So it tries to normalize this conversation. They work with the Ad Council on PSAs and have amazing PSAs there. You should definitely go check that link. And they also do case scenario videos for providers who are interested in screening and to show what kind of barriers might come about and how you might overcome them. This next one is Project Child Safe. This is a program of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, and this is uh, a trade association of the firearms industry. Again, completely neutral. The message to owners is if you own it, respect it and secure it. The message to children is stop. If you see a gun, stop. Don't touch. Get away. Tell an adult. Um, they provide resources for educators and schools, and I'm talking full-blown lesson plans. They are really extensive. They've got McGruff the crime dog um, and these programs they're just kind of ready made to be put into a school and they also provide a vast amount of safety resources for owners. Finally this is our Eddie Eagle program uh, in Kentucky and this is a program of the NRA and I know that may surprise you um, and it may surprise you when I tell you that um, that it's very neutral but it really is very neutral and the whole reason they got this program into schools in Kentucky, and by the way, they've gotten it into an entire school district and are poised to get it into a second, is because when they first went and said, can we put in gun safety programs, they said, no, no, because it was perceived as being anti-gun. When they said, well, this is a program of the NRA, then the administration listened, um, saw that it was very neutral. And I'll tell you, in the first school they went into, they had 500 um, kids in the school, they offered an opt-out for parents. At first, about 15 families opted out. 
they made some calls just to say, hey, this is just about safety. Um, and at the end of the day, only two kids from one family opted out of this program. It's gone over really, really well. It is developed again with gun owners and gun preventionists and early childhood curriculum specialists. Um, so that's the Eddie Eagle program. Eddie goes into the school, by the way, there's a, a costume and delivers a program and there's a catchy tune and um, the schools report that the kids continue to sing it uh, way past us being there. So I think that is the last of my slides. Uh, Gary Ankita, should I stop sharing for the purposes of seeing one another? Yes, yes. So let's, um, uh, great. So we're going to adjourn to the uh, panel, which Dr. Sagar is going to moderate. Um, I do want to, I, I neglected to mention uh, when we started that um, based on really the um, wave of uh, gun violence uh, during COVID and, and in the last year and shooting school shootings and the like, uh, the Physician Enterprise um, uh, committed to at least have um, a quarterly um, topic uh, on this conversation. Um, and in between, we have a group that's working on all kinds of things and collaborating uh, with both Laura and Shelley in, in this project. And so uh, our worry at that time was we all get very upset when these things happen, uh, mass shootings and the like, and then we all go back to our day jobs. And so the goal here is to keep uh, this live, to keep it in front of folks. Um, this is one way, uh, and behind the scenes, uh, Dr. Sagar, myself, Dr. Dudas, and others are working with um, Shelly and Laura to uh, kind of keep this going. And, and we do have some questions in the chat, but uh, Ankita, I'm going to turn this over to you. And Gary, can I make one quick comment that I sure. forgot to mention? We also understand there is a direct tie uh, to some forms of gun violence to the mental health situation. Yep. And I don't want people to think we're not addressing that. We advocate uh, for legislation and funding and try and address it internally. Um, it is not, we understand when you look at those suicide rates and the number of, uh, of harm yes. done that way, there are clear connections. Um, that's not the purpose of our talk today, but I don't want people to think we believe this is just a gun issue. It is a multifaceted issue but, that's driving this. And and we can certainly see from the work that, that you and Laura and the system have done um, uh, and the divisions that it's it's getting looked at it that way, which I think is a great thing, including shareholder advocacy. Okay, Ankita. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I think we have a couple of questions from our audience members, so I would love to start there. And then perhaps I can uh, tap on Dr. Dudas to give us his thoughts and reflections as well. Um, so first question that was posed by one of our audience members was, do you have any sense of like what percentage of fatal events may have been prevented? Um, if the existing processes and laws were sort of fully implemented and recognized um, in the first place? Uh, I can speak to that, yes. There are um, some studies that have come out and I can share some of those with you for, for sharing with a greater group later. But there are studies and there's one in particular I can think of that um, looked at sort of state laws and one state that rolled back some of their gun violence laws and one that pushed them forward. And you saw the rates of violence um, absolutely mirror that. So uh, Daniel Webster um, is the man that does this, and I'm trying to remember what university he's affiliated with. But there are there are studies that show that really the common sense laws too. We're talking background checks, safe storage, red flag laws. Those are the ones that have been really studied the most, um, and I think help us to to make a good case um, for that kind of prevention. So I'll share those links afterwards, Ankita. It's great. It's great. One of the stats that comes to my mind, I think, um, from last year was, I want to say about 4 million children were in homes with a firearm that was unlocked and loaded based on a survey done in the community across the U.S. So it's pretty significant to your point. Um, there is room for improvement here. So thanks. Um, and then the next question that I guess I'll pose to both you and Shelley um, is, you know, if if we as an individual happen to be part of a 
firearm injury prevention action group or a violence prevention action group, how can we help or how can we plug into the common spirit health advocacy to sort of help make sure that we're in parallel and making momentum happen on both ends? Uh, Shelly, do you want me to take that? Yeah, and, and I'll add something on at the end because I had another question okay. about the question. Okay, okay, that's great. Yeah, um, well, certainly we do have um, regional advocacy liaisons that we can connect you with. But I would also encourage you um, to find out if you have one of our community-based violence prevention programs in your community, um, because uh, we love partnering and, and we love all the support we can get. And honestly, physicians provide a trusted voice that is so essential in this, um, in, in all of these discussions. So, you know, if you want to know, if you have a program there, please reach out to me. Um, I, I can share my email um, here in the chat, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to connect you as well as connect you with some of your regional policy advocates. And I, I read the question, it said a political action group, and sometimes those are political fundraising groups. Um, and that is harder for you to link into us because as a not-for-profit organization, we do not give money um, to political action committees as an organization, nor do we endorse candidates um, because it would violate our not-for-profit status. So political action committees, we actually um, encourage people to participate in at an individual level because it's using your voice and you can elect people who you, uh, you think will improve your communities. Um, and vote your conscience, but the dollars have to come from you personally. Thanks, both of you. I think it's a it's a very important but uh, significant difference to to say, um, Dr. Dudas. I wanted to invite you into the panel and start to hear your reflections or questions that you may have for our guests. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, maybe more just comments than than wisdom from from my side, but. Um, you know, I, I truly appreciate this presentation and I appreciate all the work that is happening. Um, you know, we certainly the 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 larger mass shootings get the most attention and and all this work is really important um, to focus on, um, you know, really thinking about firearm safety and and um, secure storage. I, you know, from my perspective as a pediatrician, you know, we, we did have a shooting up the, just at the high school up the street in the fall, and that was really devastating to our community. But even more commonly, uh, over the weekend, uh, I was on the street and a funeral procession was going by from a child who had died of suicide, and we see that all the time. And so I really appreciate you, Shelley, calling out the importance of addressing the mental health aspect as well because there's just such a strong connection. And this is what we're seeing in our offices every day, especially I think so much highlighted by the pandemic, um, the, the impact of children's mental health and adolescent mental health, and the, the key importance of making sure that when they are going through that, that they are in a safe environment. And that's what's so important, I think, about ensuring that there aren't really strong lethal means of taking one's own life um, close by and available to kids. So th I just want to say thank you for your work and and it's really important. Um, yeah, I, I just add, uh, Michael, thank you. And and uh, honestly, it's um, kids and adults in terms of suicide, right? And and uh, those numbers are uh, around 50% um, of suicide deaths of, in adults and kids uh, are from guns and um, uh, I'm not sure how to say this, but most of those attempts are 100% lethal. Um, uh, one of the other statistics about that is if people uh, are delayed by 10 minutes, sometimes they change their mind. And so when you think about gun locks and all those sorts of things, um, it's helpful. Um, I wanted to make uh, just two other comments. One um, is that for those of us who are clinicians on the uh, on this um um, Zoom, uh, there are also your professional societies, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, American yeah. Academy of Family Practice, American College of Physicians, uh, uh, physicians, and so forth, who have active programs 
around uh, gun safety, gun violence. And um, in addition to the work that Common Spirit does, um, that is a huge opportunity for advocacy um, outside of Common Spirit, where obviously we all uh, work for Common Spirit, but our professional associations, uh, I think, have taken this up in a serious way. And, and I just want to remind folks of, of that. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, bring up, and uh, we're actually going to put people to work in a bit and ask them to give us their opinion in a poll. Um, but um, uh, Laura mentioned this, and and uh, honestly, when when we have looked at these programs, uh, we, we would look at the program, but this is a really cool program and well-constructed. And then in the in the bottom right, there'd be a little insignia that says something like, this program is sponsored by the National Rifle, Rifle Association, or this program is sponsored by, I don't have this quite right, the National Firearms Trade Association and so forth. And we, so we said to Laura, well, what's that? How does that work? And, and you heard her talk about it. And, and uh, these are good programs. I'm not trying to bias the audience, but it does call into question um, how and who we partner with in the community. And, and what is our people's level of comfort around that? And so uh, it, I don't want to bias the poll, but, but internally we thought we need to look at the quality of the program, not the insignia that's on the program. But uh, so if, if people have thoughts about that on the panel or uh, folks on the chat and Q&A and Laura does, uh, and, and then we're going to ask people what their opinion is and give you a chance to vote. I just want to add to that, you know, um, that the program in Kentucky worked and is in one full district um, because it it was what the community wanted. So they didn't want, if we would have gone there with the Brady program, they were not interested in that, even though, and they wouldn't even look at it. That's the thing. So because it was an NRA program, this community looked at it and we got it into, you know, one, one district um, and another one on the way. So so I just wanted to re uh, enforce that too, because I don't want you to think that we've got this great big partnership with the you know NRA and we're right. all buddy buddies. It's just this was the program that that community heard. And when we're all on the level of our whole goal collectively is we don't want injury. We don't want injury, intentional or unintentional. And we've learned from our advocacy efforts, you have to meet the community where they are. The yes. reason United Against Violence starts with asking the community what they think the problem is, is because unless they identify the problem and engage in the problem, you have a you have a solution in in search of the maybe the wrong problem. So, um, it really is focused on what plays in the community, and what plays in your practices. So what you, you know, we are fully aware that across 21 states or 22 states now, we have the same polarization as the rest of the nation. So um, everybody has to use their best um, intuition and judgment in how to approach this in your market, in your practice. Uh, Anka, there's one more question and then maybe we could have our poll. I was thinking maybe we could do the poll oh, first. All right. I'm really okay. curious to know what our audience members think. So, so John, do you want to bring up? So we like to have a poll question or two if we just have one, but uh, what is your comfort level in sharing patient-facing materials on firearm safety branded by the NRA, National Shooting Sports Foundation, and or N Family File Fire, which is kind of on the other end of the spectrum from the, from the Brady uh, uh, group and the Ad Council. So if people would just choose their their level of comfort um, and uh, we'll see what people say. We need some of that music. Dum, 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 dum. Okay. So um, there's no value judgment attached to this, but uh, uh, you, we can kind of see where folks, um, uh, 4% uncomfortable, 17%, uh, very uncomfortable, 17% uh, uncomfortable, 13% neutral, 54% comfortable, and 13% um, uh, very comfortable. And this probably is um, uh, kind of how how we are in, in America in terms of where people live. Um, I think Shelley said it well at the beginning, we meet people where they are and um, but this is helpful for us, I think, to to know. And 
um, uh, how to proceed. Yep. Yeah. Can I say I one thing? Sure. We would really hope to that where we've got these programs in place, it begins to neutralize it throughout the community so that if, if your provider wanted to get into the arena of screening, hopefully there's part of that that heatedness that can associate be associated with this, that kind of the temperature comes down. So we would really hope that would reinforce. Thank you, Laura, for adding that. I think there's one more question and I think it's somewhat related, but really the audience is asking, you know, repeat persons who are prone to violence or have been found to be violent in the past, um, specifically with firearms, um, are becoming somewhat of a issue in our neighborhood or in our state. Like how, what can we do to help our government or our district attorneys to enforce any existing laws so that um, we can maintain safety in our community? Well, I'm gonna start with one, one public policy area we focus on and um, that we support law enforcement. So um, we don't just support every piece of legislation or at the state or federal level that um, uh, addresses gun violence in, in some way. There have been some, and I, I am not trying to get into the political uh, morass of uh, police brutality. Um, we, we understand there are those who have, but we also can't, they have tried to pass some laws that say uh, police officers can't use their guns, that police officers can't do certain holds to protect themselves. And so it it is a very sort of tricky place uh, to be. Uh, law enforcement has a, a tough job. When it comes to the judicial system um, and enforcing the laws, that's not an area we typically advocate in. Um, we will advocate for laws that are very uh, specific in how you deal with it. But um, you know the judicial process and how things get enforced is a little beyond what we as a direct organization can influence. L Laura, push back if you have a different um, opinion, but um, we understand. We've been looking at those same figures that you have about repeat offenders and looking for ways uh, systemically or legislatively to address them that make sense, um, but it's a hard area to get to. I would just add on to that, that, you know, that's one reason we love the community intervention programs and the funding that the Biden administration was able to get across the goal line, so to speak, because um, sometimes what police can't do, community-based intervention can do. Um, so we think that, you know, oftentimes, you know, we need the partnerships with the police, um, but we, we also need to be part of that solution. So that kind of funding helps our programs to do that and work in partnerships so that we can find solutions that change people's lives, honestly. All right. Uh, last words from Dr. Dudas or Dr. Sagar. Laura. I just, I just want to say thank you guys for the work and for sharing your work. And, um, you know, we're, we're certainly focused on this out here in our small region. And, and I love hearing about these programs and you've given us a lot to thought to think about. So thank you. Yeah, and I, I would just also add, I'm really grateful that we have, uh, that we are part um, of a health system that looks at this systemically um, and obviously at a very high level, which I think is appropriate for a, a, a large organization like Common Spirit Health. But uh, th there's lots of pieces of this from uh, what happens in our clinics, uh, uh, adverse childhood event screening, um, um, uh, asking people if, uh, if they have guns, are they safe at home, uh, suicide prevention, there's all of that. And then it just goes up the ladder to things like shareholder advocacy, these uh, violence prevention things that are happening across the country. So it's, uh, it's a recipe that I think we all, and all of the folks on this call have an important part of. Dr. Sagar, <laughs> you, any well, comment? Thank you so much for just a lovely, um, 
thoughtful approach. Um, I think all of us have a, a little advocate inside of us, and I think we, you've given us some avenues to pursue. So thank you. Thank you very much. To our listeners, thank you very much. Uh, our next scheduled is in two weeks. Is that right? Yes. So more to come on that. Uh, we hope everybody has a safe weekend, uh, that they get a break from the weather, uh, have some time to get some sunshine and uh, rest, be safe. Uh, to our speakers, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm.